Well, happy Easter, everybody. It's good to see you and, and your Easter bonnets and flowers, and <laughs> baby and grown children and uh, see everybody here and, and uh, pretty excited about June 1st. I'm ready to get back together in person. It's gonna be great. Well, it's Easter Sunday and many people think Easter is about a seemingly dead bulb that come to life and become uh, beautiful tulips or bare trees budding and turning green. Or I love the brown hills changing their palette, butterflies emerging from cocoons. Uh, and these are truly beautiful transformations, but uh, they're natural. It happens every year. Uh, the transformation can be explained by science. They're symbols of the real thing. Uh, when we say Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today, we're talking about something uh, different, something that doesn't happen in nature, something that's not verified or verifiable by science. Mm -hmm. Very unnatural, supernatural. Uh, we're talking about the miraculous, and that takes great faith, a faith that we can't muster up naturally, but a faith that is granted to us uh, so that we can say, as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. Uh, I got my second shot this week, and so for Yay. a short time, I was feeling in, invincible. And, uh, but, <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, I probably don't need to wait for a red light. I can just uh, step out into traffic. But I remembered, no, I'm still mortal. This only protects me from one, uh, one little thing that I can't see. And uh, I can't go playing in traffic. And it made me wonder how Jesus felt when uh, the re he was receiving all the adulation from crowds as they were going into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Did it, was it tempting for him? Did it go to his head? Uh, this is Holy Week, and in, Jesus spent most of that week in, in Jerusalem with his disciples. There was the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, certainly uh, Palm Sunday when he came in, and then there was the time they went into the temple and Jesus, uh, it says, he cleansed the temple. He flipped the tables in the temple. There's Thursday, we think it is, uh, on Thursday. We call it Maundy Thursday, mm -hmm. the Last Supper with the disciples, where Jesus, before the supper, knelt and washed the disciples' feet. I saw a good quote this week. It said, while so many seek thrones to rule from, Jesus seeks feet to wash. And that's the model that we emulate. Uh, just a foreshadowing of all the ways Jesus would serve us and serve humanity in the coming days. Jesus came to serve. They thought he came to rule, but Jesus says, yes, I came to rule, but not in the way that you think. Uh, ruling, power, leadership is not what you think. It's service. Well, then there was the arrest and then on the day we call Good Friday, the crucifixion, Jesus was nailed to the cross, uh, said his last words, and he died. And then yesterday, quiet Saturday, some people call, call it. Octavius Winslow once said, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. God was in control the whole time. Well, today we celebrate Easter Sunday, uh, the resurrection of Jesus from uh, death to life. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. Can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, he says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, Paul writes, as to one who was no, abnormally born. So Paul says Jesus appeared to 500 people, a lot of witnesses to the resurrection. 
And Luke brings us a, an interesting story of two men who were among those uh, witnesses. One is named Cleopas, and the other, we don't know his name. And uh, here's a, a picture that's probably familiar of uh, the two of them walking to a town called Emmaus, and uh, a third traveler comes upon them. And I want to read this uh, paragraph by paragraph and then make some comments. And so it's in Luke 24, verse 13. And it says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other, oops, um, about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it, it is now the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. Intriguing story. The two men, they're walking to Emmaus. And uh, we're told Emmaus is a small town about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. So they're close to where all of this happened. Jesus, uh, the trial was in Jerusalem, and the crucifixion was just outside Jerusalem. Uh, the tomb was near Jerusalem, and so they were close by all those events. It's likely, uh, we know they were followers of Jesus. They were disciples, not the 12, but that outer ring of, uh, of disciples. It's possible they saw some of these events. Uh, they had seen Jesus before, apparently, uh, maybe from a distance in a different context, but they had seen uh, Jesus. And uh, now they've heard rumors that Jesus is alive and was seen. It says the same day. So th this is still Easter Sunday. And they're walking along three days after the events uh, of the crucifixion and the trial. And they're talking as they're walking. And the Greek verb implies that they may be debating. They're trying to figure out what has happened and how can it be because it says we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped he was the one. That's how they describe the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So how their hopes must have been dashed. What a disappointment that must have been. Uh, all these uh, times, maybe for three years, they'd been following Jesus, hearing his words, and, and then seeing the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and thinking they knew what was going to happen next. It was building to a crescendo. But suddenly, instead of uh, an overthrow of the Roman government, Jesus was killed, like so many others who came and tried to overthrow the Roman government. Uh, how despondent. It says, when Jesus asked them what was going on, they stood still, their faces downcast. So even though they'd heard rumors that Jesus had reappeared, uh, their hopes were dashed. And these are, are, are the words of men whose hopes are dead and buried. The whole situation didn't seem to have any explanation. So a fellow traveler overhears them and asks to join in the walk in the conversation. Uh, we're told it's Jesus, but they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't recognize him. Uh, maybe it was the glare of the setting sun. Maybe it's because it was out of context. You know, sometimes if you see somebody and it's not in the right context, you don't recognize them. It's a surprise. And certainly we don't expect to see somebody that we know died. And, and then you don't expect to see them. 
uh, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, somebody who's dead and gone, and then you're in a crowd and you think you see them, maybe from behind, they're walking and you think, whoa, but then you remember, no, they're dead, it can't be. I remember one time I was in Safeway when I was the pastor of First Presbyterian Church and, um, and we had a preschool and there was a family, they were involved in both the church and the preschool. And they had a son, little Davy, who was in kindergarten. And so they were all in the grocery store. So I was talking to them and their little son, Davy, he was just looking up at me, just in awe. He kept saying, there's Pastor Dave. That's Pastor Dave. He couldn't believe it was Pastor Dave. He, he'd seen me, you know, quite a few days uh, during the week. He sees me, he wasn't in awe, but he couldn't believe that I eat food and that I go grocery shopping and that you might see me in Safeway. And I was talking to some of the teachers uh, about this afterwards and they said, yeah, uh, the kids are like that. They think we live here at school. Um, that's where they see us. It's the only time they see us and that they see us out of context and uh, it's kind of amazing to them. Well, only days after Jesus was whipped and beaten and nailed to a cross and dead, it says Jesus is walking, not just walking, he's traveling. He's traveling from town to town and that's how they got around was by walking. And, and so they don't recognize Jesus in this context. And plus it says their eyes were closed. So the Holy Spirit didn't let them open their eyes yet. And they were shocked. This, this fellow traveler doesn't seem to know what has happened in the last week. Everybody in the region is talking about this, but Jesus doesn't seem to know. Jesus presented himself as clueless, and, and maybe because he wanted to hear what their thoughts were, what was their interpretation of what was going on. It's like undercover boss asking the employee, what do you think of the boss? <laughs> and and so Jesus asked them what's going on. And here's how they described Jesus. They said, it's about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, is that a pretty good description of what happened? Uh, and then they described earlier in that day, uh, so it must have been Sunday, how various disciples had seen a vision of angels, and then they'd gone to the tomb, and they saw the empty tomb, but uh, they didn't see him. They just mm -hmm. saw that it was empty. Well, then having heard this, Jesus then contributes to the conversation. He's not impressed with how they described him and how they described his mission. And you can tell. He says to them, how foolish you are. I think I have a slide for that. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter in his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus begins teaching them as pictured here, and he takes them all the way through the Bible, yeah, the Bible being the Old Testament, what we call the, the Hebrew scriptures. And so Genesis to, to Malachi, uh, from Moses, all the way through the prophets, and he talks about, uh, and he gives them his interpretation of what has been going on. Maybe he mentions Isaiah 53, since they seem to have missed that part of the prophecy about Messiah. Yes, the Messiah would come and redeem Israel, but his coming was not only about triumph over governments, the Messiah must suffer like a lamb led to the slaughter in Isaiah. The chastisement of our sin is upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. See, it's not Israel's enemies who were the problem. At least they were not the only problem. Israel was also a problem says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, the coming Messiah, the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of the Romans, the iniquity of the Greeks, but also the iniquity of the Israelites. And Luke tells us that Jesus walked them through the entire scripture, showing them how God, God's consistent purpose was to be worked out. 
the terribleness of sin uh, is learned throughout the Hebrew scriptures, and so is the deep, deep love of God. In the end, this combination made the cross inevitable, necessary, unavoidable. Jesus must have explained how his death accomplished more than the overthrow of the Roman government, but the penalty for all of our sins was paid for through Jesus's death on the cross. This must have been amazing to these two disciples. The one who seemed clueless and didn't know about recent current events um, was now schooling them on what the meaning of these events were. Well, they arrived, it says, to Emmaus, their home, and they wouldn't let Jesus go on. They, they couldn't. And so it continues in Luke 24, 28. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly. Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. Still, they don't know who they're dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. The stranger, but he knows something. So, and, and we'll find out later, they had an inkling. And so he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So finally they see their eyes were opened, it says. Hmm. Were not our hearts burning? Have you had that experience? Were not our hearts burning? Now they know who they're dealing with, who they're talking with. What's the giveaway? When did they figure it out? Hmm. It was Jesus who took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and began to give it to them. What's unusual about the, this is that's the job of the host. It's the host house. It's the host bread. It's his job to break the bread and distribute it to people. But instead, Jesus jumps in before he can start and he breaks the bread and he distributes it like he's the boss, <laughs> like he is the Lord. And that's when their eyes were open. And they, they had a, a few days, well, later, Thomas would see Jesus and he would say, my Lord and my God. This is their, my Lord and my God experience when their eyes were opened. Thomas, maybe they saw Jesus' hands as he's passing out the bread and they saw the, the still fresh wounds uh, from the nails of the cross. Mm. Yeah. Well, then Jesus disappears. He's in his resurrection body. So he can appear, he can disappear. He comes and he goes, he walks through walls. He appears and he vanishes. He's not a ghost though. He eats with them. Uh, mm -hmm. He can, uh, I guess, teleport from one place to another. But instead, he, he walks with them on the, on the road. And they say, we're not our hearts burning as we walked along the road. Have you had that kind of experience? This is not our first hearing of the resurrection story, right? We've heard it in so many different ways. And, and my prayer is that, oh, Lord, may our hearts burn again when we hear your words. Well, the joy of these two men was not complete until they shared it. And you remember it's seven miles to Jerusalem and it's evening, the sun has set and they've gotta be tired, they've been walking, but they couldn't keep the good news to themselves. And so they had to be together with the disciples. So at night they jump, they go outside, they walk that seven miles, maybe they run. And, uh, and, and it says in Luke chapter 24, verse 33, it says they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Hmm. So they're all sharing their stories. They're giving, uh, updating uh, all, the, all the disciples, the twelve, but all the other disciples, whoever could fit in that room. And they're sharing stories and experiences and they're putting together the whole picture. Jesus has been seen. And look at the next words. And we'll close with this. 
while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. So logistically, I'm thinking, how did Jesus get there? Did he walk to the same path that these uh, disciples walked, but at a different time? Or, you know, he seemed to appear and disappear. So maybe he disappeared from Emmaus and then he appeared in Jerusalem. Uh, the, uh, Luke doesn't tell us the answer to that, but it's just uh, beautiful how Jesus then appears as they're talking about him. And he says, peace be with you. And it goes on, uh, but, but we'll leave the story at that point. Um, and so what do we do with this story? What does it mean for us? And I would like to suggest three things. One, it, it's a reminder that for us that death is not the end. The resurrection really happened. Not some sort of natural where a beautiful plant comes out a little tiny seed, but a miracle. Things that don't happen. Jesus died and was dead for three days plenty of time for everything to shut down and decay to start. And then he rose again in a new resurrection body. And the encouraging thing is Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, that is what we can look forward to as well. Uh, Luke 15, 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed. We're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about you and me, hmm. those who believe. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable uh, must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And from the Hebrew scriptures, Paul says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And so when we think about those who have passed on during this COVID crisis, my sister's father, uh, 94 years old. Uh, he was a pastor. We don't have to have any doubt. He is together with the Lord. Death is not the end. You think 94 years is enough time. No, he was just getting started. He never quit. And, uh, and he doesn't have to. Death is not the end. Uh, life continues. We think about Ming. And it uh, wouldn't be a surprise if Ming appeared and we'd say, who are you? Out of context. But uh, we know uh, that was not the end when he passed away. That was the glorious beginning of new life in Christ. And death is not the end. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And so we can be encouraged. We have that to look forward to. Secondly, all this comes by faith, doesn't it? It, it requires a great deal of faith to believe this, and a lot of people don't. And, uh, and and the disciples walking to the, on the road to Emmaus, they didn't know what to make of this. Yeah, they believed and they had doubts and they believed and they had doubts. Uh, but they had that experience where it says God opened up their eyes and they saw, they knew who was there. They had their experience like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Each of us need to have that experience. Mm -hmm. I pray that you have and that you will and that you do. I, I, when I got my shot, and I'm scared of shots. <laughs> I hate it on TV. Every night they talk about COVID, right? And they talk about the vaccine. And what pictures do they have to show every night when they're talking about the vaccine? The needle, that needle, they wave it around. And I'm thinking, I can't look, I can't look. So I went to get my shot. I didn't want to cry. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> and so I talked I talk to the nurse when they're doing it. And she was done and I didn't even know she pricked me. I didn't know I got the shot. So I thought, man, maybe she's faking it. Maybe it's the placebo. Well, I did get sick that night. So I thought, no, I'm, this is not my mind playing tricks on me. It's the real thing. And I started thinking, can I really believe that having two shots plus two weeks and now I am immune 90% or, or so? Am I? 
so much in belief that I'm willing to get on an airplane, that I'm willing to go into a, a crowded room with other people. Do I believe that much? It's one thing to believe, and it's another thing to have such faith that you act on it, that you step out. You do things you would never do if you didn't have that faith. And, and that's what we need to have, that my Lord and my God experience. And the final point is, there's no joy like shared joy. That's why those disciples, they couldn't wait till morning. They hopped yeah. back on the road, went the seven miles to Jerusalem, gathered in that upper room. I don't know how late they stayed up all night. Maybe they never slept. slept. And uh, excitedly sharing uh, the great news that Jesus is alive, that hope is restored uh, more so than they had before on Palm Sunday. There's hope. And that's why we gather together as best we can through technology and June 1st uh, in person. But we gather together because there's no joy like shared joy. And that's true when we share with our friends too. The hope that we have, why we're not getting discouraged during discouraging events. Uh, why we grieve, but not as those without hope when our loved ones die. And we share that experience that because Jesus rose from death to life, we will as well. There's no joy like shared joy. Let's pray.